Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. Hello, Reimagining Love listener. Welcome back to our solo episode space where you and I dive deep into issues that are at the heart of the relational self-awareness journey. If you are hoping to turn over a new leaf in your relationships this year, you may think that your work starts between you and your partner. But in today's episode, surprise, surprise, I'm going to be arguing that we actually need to start way further back before you even met your current day partner, before you even became the adult that you are today to best understand yourself, your relationship, and your patterns in the present moment. Why? Because way before we were ever involved in a romantic relationship, we were part of a family system. And that system, for better and for worse, shaped our ideas about who we are in relation to others and who we can and cannot be. In our family of origin, we begin to craft the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and who we are supposed to be. And then when we come into our present day relationships, especially our intimate relationships, these stories travel with us. These stories, of course, can be a part of your relational superpower. Perhaps you were told as a kid that you are trustworthy and so you lead with honesty in your intimate relationship. Perhaps your attachment figures reflected your kindness back to you and so you value speaking to your partner with a gentle tone. These stories can also limit what you believe is possible for you in your intimate relationships. If you were given the message that you are only as good as your last accomplishment, you are likely to be afraid of your partner seeing your imperfections. If your attachment figures were chronically stressed out, you learned how to go along without asking for help, leaving your partner today feeling like it's hard to connect with you even when you're obviously hurting. I work a lot with the language of stories because we as humans are such natural storytellers. In fact, back in the day, my dissertation chair at Northwestern University in grad school was Dr. Dan McAdams. And Dr. Dan McAdams is a personality psychologist, and he argues that the self is a story, that your personality, who you are as a person, is actually best understood via the stories that you tell about your life, yourself, your relationships, your experiences. And he, in fact, has decades of research that highlight that the stories we tell about our lives shape our mental health and shape our relational health. And that's so cool because stories, unlike, you know, facts, like stories are pliable. Stories are malleable. We can erase and rewrite and edit and tweak and refine and revise. There's so much potential, I think, for all of us, no matter our age, no matter what we've been through, to continue to work and hone and make sense of our stories. So what I want to help you understand is the stories that you carry and how those stories shape how you experience your relationships today, how they become the pair of glasses through which you view your relationship. And what I find is that a tremendously helpful kind of story-based lens to bring to this exploration is the notion of roles, right? Roles are sort of a narrative storytelling kind of a term. 
So today's episode, therefore, is all about understanding the role that you played in your family system, in the family system that you grew up in, and how that role that you played then shapes the way that you show up today for your romantic relationship. So let's start with this question. What is a role? A role is a function that is served or a part that is played in any given situation. A role is the sort of organizing principle that a person brings to the dynamic they're in, right? The role of the server at a restaurant, the role of the doctor in a room with a patient, right? Their role is sort of like the framing, the organizing principle that shapes your attitude, your positionality, how you are viewed by others, how you view yourself. It's a thing that we put on, a kind of organizer. A family is a system, like a workplace is a system. A family is a system that is made up of parts. There's the parental system, there's the sibling system, and those different systems have functions, different functions and different jobs and different responsibilities and different roles. And what we know is that when a family system is functioning well, the little people in the family are able to show up in all kinds of flexible ways sometimes quiet, sometimes boisterous, sometimes silly, sometimes serious. There's a lot of like adaptability, movability, flexibility. When a family system is functioning well, the kids are able to ask for what they need, whether that's food or attention or comfort. The kids are able to make mistakes and remain connected to the people who matter most to them. However, when a family system is under stress, one of the consequences of stress is a loss of flexibility. And that stress could be the stress of poverty, the stress of addiction, the stress of marital strain, the stress of unhealed trauma, and or the intersection of all of those things. Under stress, we become rigid. Individuals become rigid, systems become rigid. It's a fear-based response that kind of like, like, I feel it in my body right now as I'm saying it, right? Under stress, we sort of clench up, we tense up. That happens within individuals and it happens to systems. It's like the stuff is hitting the fan. Just find your lane, stay in your lane, hunker down, simplify, streamline, reduce complexity for the sake of survival. It's a survival response. It's a fear response. And so the process of assigning people, especially kids, into roles when a family system is under stress is an attempt to create stability. It's in some ways, like sort of paradoxically, it's an adaptive response. It's a way of adapting to stress. It's a coping strategy. It's a necessity, but it also is a necessity that comes with a cost. It's necessary because kids absolutely need to belong by any means necessary, even if that means sacrificing essential parts of themselves. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you know that I always quote the wonderful teacher and clinician, Dr. Gabor Mate, where he talks about kids forever being willing to trade authenticity for belonging, right? Kids will step into a role a little narrow box of a role in the hopes of creating stability because survival depends on it. And it's necessary because it makes sense to stop asking for things that you simply cannot receive, right? That narrowing down, that hunkering down makes sense. It makes sense to stop asking to be seen as both creative and tired, as both silly and serious. It makes sense to stop asking to be seen in a variety of ways when the feedback is that this system is only able to see you in one particular way on account of the stress, on account of the addiction, on account of the limits of parental unhealed trauma. So necessary, but also limiting, right? Limiting because it means that parts of you then go unseen and underdeveloped. I'm going to introduce you now to the six roles that we tend to play in our families of origin and also how these roles then show up and have the power to wreak havoc in our intimate relationships. So I want to make sure that I give props where props are due. Virginia Satir is one of the founding mamas in the field of family therapy, and she was probably, I think, the first to talk about dysfunctional family roles. And then additionally, Claudia Black, 
and Sharon Wegscheider Cruz are also two clinicians who have written extensively about roles, specifically roles in families where a parent is struggling with addiction. So the way that I'm about to operationalize these six particular roles emerge from and is informed by that earlier family systems work. So I call these six roles the perfect one, the easy one, the struggling one, the peacemaker, the parentified child, and the rebel. And I'm going to unpack each of those roles in a moment. If you grew up in a relatively steady family of origin, you might end up seeing yourself in a few different roles. And that's because you likely got to show up in a lot of different ways, exploring lots of different aspects of yourself, exploring lots of different sort of dynamics that get going in relationships. Whereas if you grew up in a family of origin that struggled and that was led by a lot of fear, I think you're going to be more likely to see yourself predominantly in one or two of these roles. And the impact of playing a particular role is going to be unique to you. I'm certainly not saying that all the children who grew up as the perfect one are going to have issues with perfectionism as adults, or that all people who grew up as parentified kids are going to you know, grow up to struggle to accept love. Rather, I'm pointing out that if you're struggling with an issue or a tendency in your relationships today, it is worth considering how that issue may be connected to your earlier years. Why? Because that context matters and that's how we grow and how we heal. And if we understand the origin of a certain wound or a behavior of ours, then we can build that crucial connection. We can reach back towards our younger self and we can cultivate more self-compassion and we can start to practice new ways of being, right? If we know what parts of ourselves remained underdeveloped or unattended to, we can now start to, you know, parent ourselves today. This healing work then expands our repertoire with our intimate partner. So rather than experiencing a moment with our partner through the distorted lens of our past and playing out that role the way we've always played out that role, we become a bit more liberated to meet the moment in a new way, in a more relational way, with a bigger capacity to stay calm, to stay present, to stay curious, to see the dynamic between ourselves and our partner as just that, a dynamic. As you know, relational self-awareness is about understanding your relationship to relationships. So it's in creating that clearer sense of our early experiences that we create shifts in our lives today, loving with more flexibility, more authenticity, and more ease. So as part of this episode, I want to offer up a resource that I really, really love. It's a family of origin roles quiz that my team and I developed that you can find on my website. It's designed to help you identify which of these six roles you played in your family when you were growing up. It's only 12 questions long, and I think it's a really good tool to use for self-reflection and as a conversation starter. So you can find a link to the quiz in the show notes or go to my website at dralexandrasolomon.com slash roles quiz. Okay, so before I unpack the roles, just a quick review of a couple of important terms I'm going to use here. If you've been listening for a while, these terms are not new. Your original love classroom. Your original love classroom is just your family system, the system you grew up in, your family of origin. It's where you first witnessed and experienced relationships modeled by the people who raised you. And as a child, you consciously and unconsciously took notes of the behaviors and the emotions of the big people around you. In this way, you receive messages growing up, some healthy and helpful, others unhealthy, unhelpful, that impact the way you understand and interact with love and with the people that you love today. And your experiences in your original love classroom become your love template. Your love template lives inside of you as a particular set of expectations and hopes and fears and longings and beliefs that you bring into your intimate relationships based on those early experiences. And your love template develops based on both observations that you made and experiences that you had. So the observations you made are how you watch the big people talk to each other, the differences that you observe between how the girls were treated and how the boys were treated, how responsibilities got divided up based on gender, how big emotions got handled, how big differences of opinion got handled 
how the big people touched or didn't touch each other, who was allowed to ask for what and what circumstances and who was not allowed to ask. And then experiences, the experiences that you had also become part of your love template. And that's about how the big people in your family talked to you, talked about you and treated you. So the experiences might include what you were allowed to ask for and what you were not allowed to ask for. The feelings of yours that were tolerated and celebrated and the feelings of yours that were shut down or ignored. What you were praised for, what you were punished for, how you were touched and in what context who you were told you had to be based on your sex and gender and who you were told that you could not be or should not be based on your sex and gender. Okay, so let's dig in to these six common roles that kids tend to play in their families of origin. So for each of these roles, I'm going to talk about three elements. First, the function of that role. Second, the gifts that you may have developed as a result of playing that role. And third, the challenges or the growing edges that you may have as a result of playing that role. I really like that way of spelling it out because it's saying, okay, there's this role, but please remember that any role you played was tied to a function. It was you trying to serve a purpose on behalf of your family system. It was you trading authenticity for belonging and for survival. I really also think it's important to include the gifts because I want us always to know that, as you've heard me say, our gifts and our wounds are next door neighbors. So I think that focus on gifts helps us really see ourselves as whole and helps us kind of hold that nuance. And then of course, the growing edges or the challenges that emerge from that role. Okay, so role number one, the perfect one. So it's actually quite helpful for a struggling family system to have someone play the part of the perfect one. Why? Well, the function of the perfect one is the perfect one sort of reminds the family that we must be okay right? If I've got straight A's, we must be okay. If I'm a superstar athlete, we must be okay. So the perfect one sort of shows the outside world and shows the big people like, hey, things aren't that bad around here. Look what I'm able to do. The gift that emerges from playing the part of the perfect one is you tend to be able to perform at quite a high level. You tend to be quite competent in an area like you know how to drive yourself, how to push yourself, how to strive, how to accomplish. And then the next door neighbor, the challenge or the growing edge that goes along with the perfect one is oftentimes that perfect one expects as much from others as they do of themselves. They can be a bit exacting, a bit impatient, sort of projecting, like I'm used to talking to myself in this way. So of course, I'm going to be at risk of talking to you in this very same way. The second role is the easy one. Again, for a family system that is struggling, it's really helpful to have an easy one. The easy one is like, it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's cool. It's fine by me. You guys go ahead. Whatever is good. You know, I can work within that. So the function of having an easy one is an easy one reduces stress on the big people. The easy one is the like the opposite of the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know, this is the the wheel that just kind of oils itself, right? It's just like, no, it's okay. I'm okay. The gift that comes from having been the easy one is easy ones tend to grow up to be people who are flexible, who are adaptable, who are independent. They're kind of used to doing for themselves. And there's some gifts in that. There's some gifts in being able to put yourself in a situation and be able to kind of find a way through it. The growing edge or the challenge is if you grew up as an easy one, it might be really difficult for you to be vulnerable and certainly difficult for you to ask for help. Easy ones in romantic relationships tend to turn two-person problems into one-person problems right? because they're so unaccustomed to asking for help. They sort of want to be alone and figure something out on their own. And that can be a source of distance then in a couple relationship. Okay. The struggling one. This is the third role. In the field of family therapy, we call this an identified patient or a symptom bearer. Sometimes in a family system, there's one person who's acting up, 
or acting out. And there's a way that doing that, being the symptom bearer, kind of organizes the big people, the the big people or the whole system, in fact, get sort of organized around the common goal. The common goal is getting the struggling one to be different, getting the struggling one to settle down, getting the struggling one to get better. And this is challenging, of course, because there are actual mental health challenges. There are actual learning disabilities. There is actual neurodiversity. So I think that there can be a kind of confusing intersection here of having, for all of these, frankly, of what are the kind of organic or innate personality tendencies or neurological tendencies intersecting with family systems. I would never, ever, you'll never, ever hear me say that the sum total of who we are as people can be ascribed to family dynamics. No, family dynamics are a big part of it, but there's also temperament. There's also, you know, how spirit made us. There's also other elements that kind of go into who we are. So I want to just make sure that we hold onto that complexity. So The identified patient or the struggling one organizes the family system around this common goal. The gifts that can come from growing up as a struggling one, that you oftentimes learn self-advocacy because you've had to face some adversity. You've got some self-awareness. You understand yourself perhaps uh, a bit better than you perhaps otherwise would. And the resilience, resilience from having had to maybe work harder than your siblings did or you know, just go through a bit more struggle and challenge than the kids that you grew up with. The challenge from this role of the struggling one can be that there may be some dependency on others, some difficulty seeing your own strength, some difficulty feeling like you can actually do it on your own, and maybe some difficulty standing up for yourself. If you're used to people helping you because that's what helps the family feel cohesive, it may be hard for you to say, it's okay, you guys, it's okay, I've got it. I can stand up for myself, I can handle myself, I can take care of myself because there's a way that your dependence offered the big people a path towards cohesion and meaning and purpose. The fourth role is the peacemaker. So the peacemaker is the one who kind of gets right in between the big people who are fighting and settles them down. It's an it's an active role. And the function of having a peacemaker is that you are there to create some family unity. You're there to help the sides understand each other. You're there to broker a treaty. The gifts that come from having played the role of the peacekeeper as you are oftentimes compassionate, you oftentimes are really there to protect people who need protection. I think peacemakers maybe tend towards law enforcement and the justice system, like you're there to sort of like calm the scene down. Peacemakers also become quite collaborative. They know how to help the sides, you know, see the benefit in the other one's perspective. And the challenges or the growing edges for peacemakers tend to be suppressed anger, right? You were there in the line of fire, so you never got to be angry yourself. You had to push down your anger to help other people be calm. And right next to that is difficulty identifying your own emotions. You know, peacemakers are sort of lying in wait. They're waiting to see if stuff's going to hit the fan. They're sort of so keyed into the big people's feelings, or they were so keyed into the big people's feelings that they never really developed that ability to attend to their own emotions. So then the challenge is difficulty identifying your own emotions. The fifth role is the parentified child. The parentified child is the one who's sort of the family's counselor, the one who gets triangulated in, meaning that you get kind of stuck, again, sort of similar to the peacemaker. The parentified child is also kind of stuck in between the big people. But my distinction here is where the peacemaker was kind of running interference. The parentified child tends to be a source of comfort and validation for one parent primarily. And it's a role much more of like, empathy and comfort versus kind of actively calming people down. So the parentified child is there to empathize with the challenges that the big people are facing. Again, that role serves a function. You know, a parentified child who is doing their role will end up making the parent feel better. Their listening ear actually feels like a source of comfort to a stressed out parent. It's inappropriate but it is sometimes, sometimes things can be inappropriate and still work, right? So there was a function to that role. 
The gift here is a gift of empathy, of patience and gentleness. A lot of parentified children grow up to be therapists. There is no surprise there. Those dots practically connect themselves. The challenges or the growing edges of having been a parentified child are that parentified kids tend to have difficulties with boundaries. It is like, I don't even know the difference between my business and your business. I'm so used to being in other people's business that I don't even really actually know where my lane is. And along with that can be that need to be needed, that way of shoring up your own self-worth by being helpful and necessary to the people around you. And again, being helpful and necessary isn't really intimacy. So in an intimate relationship then that can look like a lot of over-functioning, I'm going to feel my feelings and my partner's feelings. I'm going to be too responsible to my partner, too responsible for my partner. Okay, finally, the rebel. The role of the rebel is sort of (laughs) calling bullshit, you know? Like, we all see this, right? No one's gonna say it? Okay, I guess I'll say it. The rebel calls it like it is. Why is that necessary? That seems like it's actually disruptive, but I think it's necessary because there are times that a system needs to sort of be snapped back into reality or sort of awaken from its slumber. So the rebel is there to be like, you know, calling stuff like it is and saying the things that nobody else will say, doing the things nobody else will do, almost like a protective guardrail for a system. And here again, we see the gifts of like leadership and a kind of ferocity, like a kind of fearlessness that can be a gift. And then the challenge or the growing edge is this sort of hypervigilance, like How do you ever join a system, even a couple system, if you are so used to standing outside of it and observing it? So a difficulty, like just letting yourself melt into a group or a couple, like almost like a fear of belonging because the rebel never had the luxury of belonging. The rebel was sort of standing guard to notice and and comment on stuff. So a difficulty connecting because of that need to be different, because of that need to set themselves apart from what's happening in the family system. Okay, so I know that was a lot. So as you listened to those descriptions, though, I have a hunch that one or maybe two of those felt particularly familiar to you. So this could be a good moment if you want to pause this episode and go and take that quiz the family of origin role quiz. It's in the show notes. There's a link in the show notes. And I want you to see if your instinct aligns with the results of the quiz. If you end up getting a different result than the one you expected, just get curious. Like what are are there elements of truth in both of those? What are the ways that you specifically disagree with the results that the quiz gave you? Like just, you know, rather than it being that like either you were right and I was wrong or I was right and you were wrong. Just be curious about why was your first hunch different than what the quiz showed up as. Okay, so I've presented now this distillation of roles. I presented it now to thousands of people over the last year. So I want to respond to the two most common questions that I've been asked after I present this framework. The first one is, what if I see myself in more than one role? And I think that you may very well see yourself in more than one role. Well, the first thing I'd say is take the quiz and see how that clarifies it. Second of all, it may be what I was saying before, that this might be a manifestation of the fact that there is quite a bit of health in your family of origin. If you identify with a few of these roles, it may be that you got to play a few of these roles. You got to have a range of positionalities in your family of origin because your family of origin could handle that. There was enough stability and adaptability in the system to be able to handle you sometimes being a source of comfort, sometimes being a little bit, you know, contrary, sometimes flying under the radar. Like it may be that you got to pivot because the system let you pivot. It also may be that this ability to see yourself in a few different roles is a reflection of your healing. You might identify with more than one role because you've kind of earned some adaptability by working on yourself and working on your relationships. And then 
finally, of course, you may see yourself in more than one role because this is a heuristic. This is a framework. It is one lens through which you can learn more about your patterns and your tendencies. None of us is reducible to a label or a category, even kind of a, you know, I think a pretty juicy one, like what I've just laid out, I think is pretty juicy, but it's simplified. It's it's simplistic. The point of this isn't to stick some capital T truth label on top of your head that holds the power to explain your whole life to you. The point of this is just to give you a little portal for exploration and for conversation. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a label that explains everything. Okay. The second question I get asked a lot is, what part of my childhood should I be thinking about when I reflect on these roles? And I don't think that there's a perfect moment that you should be thinking about. I really like the idea, frankly, of you identifying a role from elementary school and then a role from early adolescence and then a role from later adolescence. Why do I like that? Because the mere exercise of doing that, the mere exercise of thinking, who was I in elementary school? Who was I in junior high? Like that exercise is an exercise in narrative coherence. When you pair a chapter of your life story with a role you played, that's you telling your story. You're piecing together a narrative of who you were. And research has found that creating coherence in your narrative an understanding of why you felt what you felt, why you made sense of the events in your life the way that you did. That process is healing. Creating narrative coherence is healing. Making sense of the past opens up new possibilities for today. That's frankly, the heart of what we do in therapy, making sense of our stories. So just explore and play and see what you come up with. What I've also found is that People can play one role during one stage of their growing up and another role in another stage of their growing up. And your role may have changed in light of a significant event in the life of your family. Maybe there was a divorce or a death or an older sibling moved out or a younger sibling was born. So if you were, for example, the perfect one when your dad was battling addiction, and then your dad got sober, that role that you played, that perfect one role, may have gotten to fade into the background as he was practicing his recovery. And it may have made some space then for you to take on another role, or it may have lessened the need for you to be in a particular role. Before we move on to the question of what all of this means for your life today, especially for your romantic relationships today, I want to offer you some sentence completions that are designed to help you further flesh out your role. If you've been with me for a while, you know (laughs) I love a good sentence completion. It just lets us, I don't know, just sort of put our thoughts down on paper and, uh, you know, just sort of further refine what we're thinking, what we're feeling. So as I read these to you, please feel free to pause and write a little bit in response. I love the idea of you listening to this right now, curled up with your journal and your pen and doing a little bit of journaling as we go. So let me run through these with you. When I was little, the big people in my home needed me to dot, dot, dot. When I was little, it was hard for the big people in my home when I would, when I was little, I was praised for the following qualities. When I was little, I was punished or shamed or shunned for the following qualities. When I was little, a need that I had that went unmet by the big people in my home was, when I was little, I often felt, and you can add to that a because, When I was little, I often felt blank because dot, dot, dot. Okay, a few more that get you into identifying the gifts that emerge from your role. Because of the role I played in my family of origin, I excel at dot, dot, dot. Because of the role I played in my family of origin, people in my life today can count on me to... Even though I perhaps wish 
I had not had to play that role in my family of origin. It did teach me to. And then the last three are an opportunity for you to reflect on the price that you paid for having played that role. Because of the role I played in my family of origin, I never really learned to dot, dot, dot. Because of the role I played in my family of origin, it tends to be hard for me to. Because of the role I played in my family of origin, I know I need to get better at. Okay, so much, so much courage in just being willing to pursue this avenue of self-reflection. Truly, this is not, (laughs) this is not an easy episode. All right, let's move on though. Let's connect the dots between then and now. How does the past, how do these roles from the past show up today? If you've been listening for a while, you may have heard me talk already about the three pathways whereby the past shows up in the present. I call these paths, number one, the path of repetition, number two, the path of opposition, and number three, the path of integration. When you think about your role, from back then and how it connects to your life today, one of three things are happening. You're either repeating that role or you're flipping that role or you're softening the rough edges of that role. It's either path of repetition, path of opposition, or path of integration. Okay, so path of repetition. That means that you are repeating in your relationships today the same role that you played when you were little path of repetition. It's like, a, it's like a direct line from then to now. So for example, you were the perfect one in your family of origin and you find yourself tending to get defensive when your partner gives you any kind of feedback, right? Because in your mind, the way that you get love is you are perceived as the perfect one. You are beyond reproach. So it's a redo. Or for example, you were the parentified child in your family of origin, and today you find yourself taking on your partner's problems as your own, because that feels like love. You were your mom's safe place to land when she was upset, and you automatically, quick as a rabbit, (laughs) take on your partner's problems as your own. They're upset, you're right there. There's not even any space. You collapse the space between them and you because you are so used to rushing in when somebody that you love and that you need is suffering. It's like a knee-jerk reaction for you. Not judging it. It's lovely. I get it. It kept you safe and secure then. It may be creating the seeds of resentment now, right? It may be keeping your partner from practicing their own self-soothing now. So we're not judging it. We're just exploring it. Okay, another example, you were the rebel in your family of origin. And then today, you have a hard time accepting the dynamics with your partner as they are, meaning that you're kind of constantly in a spot of calling out what's wrong or what's broken or what's not okay. It's really hard for you to just like accept that your relationship with your partner is messy, it's growing, it's shifting, it's changing. You're kind of consistently there to point out that's not right. That's not right. Look at this. Look at this. That's the redo, right? That's the path of repetition. Okay. Another way this can play out from then to now is that path of opposition. So rather than a straight line, it's like a loop-de-loop. It's an opposite. It's a 180. On the path of opposition, you are hell bent on not getting stuck in the same role that you played back then. So you are vigilant for any whiff of familiarity and you fight fiercely against it. It's sort of a never again stance. And listen, this desire to flip the script, it makes total sense. You grew up and there was pain and you said, hell no, not that. And you committed yourself to the opposite of what you saw and experienced. The problem here is that 180 degrees is rarely the answer. Sure, you're not reenacting that role that you played back then, But your moves in the present day end up being limited because you are forever trying to position yourself as not that, not that, not that, 
right? And that the very existence of not that is a reactive stance. You're in reaction to something else. It's a reactive stance. It's a narrow stance rather than something that is generative and flexible and really like kind of coming from inside of you. So the path of opposition ends up sticking you in another potentially equally limiting box. And again, this is not judgment. This is just talking about how these things move from then to now. So for example, you were the easy one in your family of origin. So in your intimate relationship today, you are very aware, very, very aware of which of your needs are being met and which of your needs are not being met, right? You're just, you're tending to that always. You're like, hell no, never again am I going to, you know, bite my tongue for the sake of peace. And so the 180 is that, you know, your partner needs to know everything you need right now, right now, right now. Another example would be if you were the struggling one in your family of origin, in your intimate relationship, then you can be really sensitive to feeling like a relationship challenge is being put at your feet. You can be really sensitive to that idea or any kind of whiff or idea that this is happening because of you. Finally, if you were the peacekeeper in your family of origin, in your intimate relationship today, you may shut down or withdraw when your partner brings you problems, especially problems external to the two of you. If your partner has got a workplace drama or a problem within their family system, you may shut down, pull away, and be really resistant to engaging around it because, again, it's that like, no more, never again. I've put myself in the middle of way too many dramas in my life. I'm out of here. So it's that that idea, once again, of that like 180. Path three is the path of integration. This is the path we walk when we understand the role that we played when we were younger and when we begin to step out of it mindfully and intentionally, when we begin to nurture those long lost parts of ourselves. When we understand the gifts and the limitations that existed within our family of origin, the ways in which we were seen, the ways we were ignored, the parts of us that were celebrated, the parts of us that were neglected. So this is you. This is the work that you are striving to do right here, right now with me. Your engagement with reimagining love week after week moves you toward that path of integration. It softens the edges of those roles. It expands you. And that path of integration liberates us from the old ways. It's like we say thank you. We say thank you to the role that we played at the time we had to play it. And we put that role into retirement and we reclaim lost parts of ourselves and we create new possibilities today. So what does this all mean? I think our desire to be categorized, to categorize ourselves is so intrinsic in us. You know, it's what we see. It's, it's like our pull towards zodiac signs. It's our pull towards love languages. It's our pull to those quizzes that used to be on the backs of magazines and now they're wherever on BuzzFeed. I think we're drawn to those because they create in us a feeling of belonging, a sense of being seen. I think these categorizational systems help us make sense of the complexity of the world around us and the complexity of what's going on inside of us. And sorting through these different frameworks, including now that you have this family of origin roles framework, when we, when we play with those, it provides a mode of self-inquiry and it provides a, an avenue for relational exploration. When we understand where we've come from, where our partners come from, that's a powerful tool for our relationships. Okay, so how does it look today? So in a moment, when you notice yourself reacting in a way that seems to run contrary to your conscious understanding of what's happening, it's like this little part of you has a quizzical look. Like, huh, my reaction to this moment with my partner is a 10, but there's a part of me that's sort of like, is it really a 10 or is it more like a four, but it's feeling like a 10? Like in that space of what's happening versus the size of what I'm feeling about what's happening, like that's a clue. That's a little blinking light that something from the past is being activated here. 
And that's a moment, like that's a moment when your reaction is really big. It's a moment to just pause and check in with yourself. Like, whoa, this is really intense for me. What is going on? What is this reminding me of? And then you pull for your role. You reach for your role. Okay, how might that role you played when you were growing up, how might that be shaping and fueling your emotional reaction? Aha. When my partner gave me that feedback, it activated that old perfect one role that I used to play, that I used to play so well. I played it in my family because in my family, I really did have to be beyond reproach so that the big people could feel okay. But I don't have to be perfect now. My partner can see me as less than perfect and we can still be okay. So In that way, you follow your emotional reaction. You notice your emotional reaction. You call up your role. Wait a minute. Am I responding from that role place, from that old role I used to play? Okay. And if I am, I don't have to beat myself up for it. I don't have to say, therefore, my partner's right and I'm wrong. I can just say, oh, here I go again. Wow, that role was powerful. Wow, it's hard to put that role into retirement. But that was then, and this is now. And I don't have to be today with my partner who I had to be when I was growing up. So a few questions to help you as you mull this over. Number one, what's an experience that you had recently that reflects to you, that highlights to you, that you actually are still at risk of playing your family of origin role even today? Think about maybe an experience you had at work recently with friends, with your partner, where you're like, huh, I think in that moment I responded to the workplace drama or I responded to the friendship dynamic. I responded from a role based place. I kind of slipped right in to that easy one role. I slipped right in to that parentified child role. Number two, what's an experience you had recently that reflects that you actually are working to put that original family of origin role into retirement? In other words, can you think of a moment when you did not rescue someone even though you grew up as a parentified child? Or a moment when you did speak up for what you needed even though you grew up as the easy one? I think it's important that you also, if you're going to kind of notice times that you slip back in, I want you also to notice the times when you didn't slip back in. Okay, third question. If you're in an intimate relationship, what do you want your partner to understand about that family of origin role of yours? Number four, if you are in an intimate relationship, what could your partner do to help you reduce your risk of falling into your old family of origin role? In other words, how can your partner be an ally in your healing? What might be helpful for them to hold on to or remember to help you resist that urge to quickly and maybe even outside of your conscious awareness just slip back in to your role? Okay, as important as you understanding your role is you understanding your partner's role. Knowing the role that your partner played in their family of origin can help you out in moments when you're sitting there scratching your head, like, why the heck is my partner making such a big deal out of this? Why is my partner expressing their opinion so freaking intensely? Or when you're watching your partner become judgmental or grow rigid, you can understand them more deeply by understanding the role that they had to play when they were little. And when you do that, you can feel less frustrated in the face of their emotionality. You can feel less confused about their response. Ah, that is looking like a role-based response to me. Understanding the role your partner played in their family of origin can also help you do your part to create more emotional safety between the two of you by just helping you be aware of their growing edges. I want to be super clear. I'm not asking you to tiptoe around their wounds. I'm not asking you to be so perfect that you never activate their old wounds, that you never, that you, that your behavior is such that they never, ever, ever are at risk of slipping into that role-based behavior. I'm not asking for that. I'm just asking you to stay curious. How might this moment of intensity be a reflection of pain from their past? 
by, by even just being curious about that, you open up the possibility that you can help them do this moment differently. You can just create the space for them to do this moment differently. Making that link can help you respond with a bit more compassion, a bit more patience, and empowerment, like actual true empowerment. You do not need to take your perspective off the table just because they are activated by an old role dynamic. It's not either or. You can be gentle and firm, right? You can be gentle with the activation of that old role they used to play, and you can be firm that your perspective has merit alongside their hurt. Both those things can be true. Both those things can be held. So how do you get there? Well, ideally, your partner also listens to this episode. Ideally, your partner also takes the family of origin roles quiz. Talk together about what you learned. And I want to suggest that you and your partner will benefit by keeping in mind two different types of conversations. I'm calling these the 10,000 foot conversation and the pressure valve conversation. The 10,000 foot conversation is a conversation that you initiate not in the heat of the moment. It's a conversation you initiate when things are calm, when there's some ease. And it's a conversation that has that kind of like back of the magazine quiz vibe about it. It's sort of like, I listened to this podcast episode. I would love for you to listen to it or at least take this quiz. Like, I know what my role is. I want to know what your role is. Like just a conversation about the roles that you played. And I'm going to give you a little bit more on that in a moment. The other kind of conversation is the pressure valve conversation. And this conversation is what you get to do when you and your partner use your new deepened understanding of yourselves to take a step back during a tender moment. Here, you're going meta for a moment in the middle of an intense conversation. There's a chance to gently, you know, wave the white flag and point to those big questions that you discussed before. Wait a minute. Do you think it's possible that what's happening right now is connected to the role that we played in our family of origin? Oh, shoot. I think this might be my rebel taking over for a minute. It's hard for me to feel like other people are telling me what to do. All right, let's pause, rewind, and try again, right? It's like speaking about the role. So in this way, these two conversations, the 10,000 foot conversation and the pressure valve conversation, they become a self-awareness opener and a compassion opener. The final thing I want to offer you in this episode are some questions that are rooted in relational self-awareness to support you in both of those kinds of conversations. Okay, so first, discussion questions for the 10,000 foot conversation. So notice that some of these are going to be pulled from the earlier self-reflection, but now they are framed for relationship conversation. Okay, so here's the two of you answering together in a relaxed moment, on a walk, in the tub, on the couch, super cozy. You're just talking through these questions together. Okay, one, which of the six roles do each of you identify with? Why? Number two. What is something your partner might not know about the role that you played in your family of origin? So each of you is responding to this, right? Number three, what is the gift of your partner's role that you really appreciate? Number four, what do you a little bit envy about the role that your partner tends to play? Number five, What's an experience that you had recently that reflects that you are still a little bit at risk of playing your family of origin role even today? Number six, what's an experience you had recently that reflects that you are working hard to put your family of origin role into retirement? Number seven, what could your partner do to help reduce your risk of falling back into your old role? Number eight, in what ways are your roles complementary. In other words, how do each of your roles bring out the best in each other? Number nine, in what ways do your roles collide? In other words, how do your roles tend to fuel misunderstanding or judgment between the two of you? Number 10, during a conflict, what do you want to remember with loving kindness about the impact of your role on the relationship dynamics. Number 11, during a moment of conflict, 
what do you want to remember with loving kindness about the impact of your partner's role on your relationship dynamics? Okay. Ugh, I just love the idea of the two of you working your way through those questions and each of you sharing your thoughts and your musings on each of those. In terms of that pressure valve conversation I was mentioning before, how can you and your partner make use of this family of origin roles language when things are getting tough between you? I want you to remember your reflections on how your roles collide, right? So in a moment of calm, if you're talking about, I think sometimes our roles can collide because I start to feel like I'm doing everything and you're doing nothing, but that's my role talking. Then hopefully, possibly, maybe, in the heat of the moment, the two of you can be like, aha, here we go. This is, this is our role colliding. I'm the easy one, so I'm hunkering down and slipping under the radar, but you are the parentified one, so you're trying to do everything for both of us. You're working overtime for both of us. It's sort of like, wait a minute, how are our roles getting kicked up right now? Also think about what do you each want to remember right now? So in the heat of the moment, can you say, okay, what do we need to remember? What do we need to remember? How, you know, how's our role sneaking up? Can you pause? The pause is so important. So in the heat of the moment, the pressure cooker strategy might just be asking for a pause. Can we please pause? That pressure cooker skill of being able to speak about the roles is just try to say something. Try to say something about roles in the heat of the moment. For example, my easy one is feeling so confused and frustrated by you being so firm and clear in expressing your needs. Or my struggling one feels like you're making this all about me. And I think perhaps your perfect one is afraid of being seen as responsible for this in any way, shape, or form, right? So like, we're not ever going to just simply call out our partner's role, like, aha, there you go again, the perfect one. It needs to be a pairing of, I think this is happening for me, and I think this is happening for you. Or my parentified child is feeling like, here we go again, it's all on me, and I wonder if maybe your rebel is so focused on calling things out that is keeping you from actually getting involved here, right? So just anything where you can put some role language to it changes the course of the conversation. It's hard. It's really hard. It's going to take practice. It's going to take stumbles and pauses and redos. But what I'm telling you is if you speak to your role, it's going to start to at least move the two of you out of that awful, awful cycle of blame and defensiveness or shut down and retreat. It moves the conflict from me versus you to my role is getting all flustered by your role and your role is getting all activated by my role. It changes the conversation. It's not me and you. It's my role and your role. Do you hear the difference? It's putting a little, little bit of space between the two of you by talking about the roles. And any move that we make that helps us step out of me versus you is a move that we make toward connection, toward empathy, toward mutual understanding. Okay, my goodness, we did it. If this exploration brought up some painful memories for you, I want to remind you of two very important things. First, I want to shine again a light on the importance of understanding the past, the context, the stories. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard work, but it's vital work. Our childhood experiences are the first chapters of our lives and understanding them helps us see the bigger story of our lives. And when we do that, we can look back to see both where we came from, but also how far we've come. The second thing I want to remind you of is that our past does not dictate our future. As an adult right here, right now, I encourage you to imagine giving that little version of you a hug. I want you to see that little version of you looking around, searching for an understanding of this crazy world that they have arrived in and trying to discover their place in it. And here you are like reaching for that little version of you, carrying that little version of you with you. 
And you are constantly growing and evolving and you're holding the hand of that little version, whether that little version was the perfect one or the easy one or the struggling one or the peacekeeper or the parentified child or the rebel, whoever that little one was, you've got them. You've got them now by the hand and you're bringing them along with you. And the two of you are looking together towards your future. If you want to keep going and engage this topic further, I have three resources for you to engage with. First, of course, the online quiz to help you figure out your role. When you take the quiz, you also get a resource packet. You know me and my resources. I love them. So you'll get a worksheet and questions, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes along with completing that quiz. So again, find that link in the show notes or visit dralexandrasolomon.com slash roles quiz. Number two, last year I did another podcast episode looking more in depth at our original love classrooms and what happens to us in the face of the challenges that our families dealt with. So that episode is linked in the show notes as well. And then finally, last month, I wrote an article for Psychotherapy Networker that explores this topic of roles. That article, you know, Psychotherapy Networker is a magazine for therapists. Therapists are the intended audience. So if you're listening and you're a therapist, for sure, take a peek. And then also just do yourself a favor and subscribe to the entire magazine. Psychotherapy Networker has been my favorite, favorite, favorite professional publication since grad school. If you are not a therapist, but if you are feeling a little bit nerdy, I really do think you will enjoy the article and the exploration of family of origin roles. And where do you think you can find it? That's right, in the show notes. (laughs) So if you enjoyed the show, I would so appreciate it if you left a review on whichever podcast platform you use. That is how podcast hosts like me reach new people who would really benefit from this kind of content. Okay, I am sending you tons of love as you do this difficult, eye-opening, healing work of understanding your past and growing relational self-awareness in the process. So until next time, be well. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love.